Welcome to Transformational Pathways, a podcast created by Toastmasters District 46 in the greater New York area, where we share conversations from influencers within the Toastmasters community and people whose lives have positively transformed by walking down the Toastmasters path. Whether you're just getting started in your career, have had recent career changes, or you're navigating different languages, we're here to help you build confidence by discovering new tools, overcoming your fears to find your voice, and engaging in a thriving community. Enjoy today's episode. Hello! Welcome to another episode of Toastmasters District 46 Transformational Pathways Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Mason, and walking the pathway with me today is our guest, Janine Letford. As the 2019 L.A. Lakers businesswoman and the 2015 California Charter Teacher of the Year, Janine is a national thought leader and creator of the concept of intercultural creativity. She is the founder and chief creative officer of Cafe Strategies, LLC, which trains C-suite executives and employees to create sustainable organizational equity and inclusion strategies as well, while unleashing their innovative thinking for themselves and in their businesses. Her first book, From Debt to Destiny, Creating Financial Freedom from the Inside Out, connects creative thinking to financial agility and was an international bestseller in five finance categories. Janine believes creative thinking thrives best in an inclusive environment and she is often called America's creative coach for her work in reigniting intercultural creativity within our workforce. Janine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. It is our pleasure. Before we start, you use, you use some $5 words there. Intercultural creativity. Janine, it sounds impressive and it sounds important, but I'm not sure my little mind understands what it is. What exactly is intercultural creativity? Tell us. Well, it's the fact that we are creative and I redefine creati- creativity. It's not just artistry. Artistry is very important, but creativity is a process of problem finding and problem solving with relevance, value, and novelty. So we're all creative, but intercultural creativity, we're looking for organizations with inclusion and to have a full inclusive organization that values you, you have to have cultural competence. You have to have the ability to Mm -hmm. observe people, to see complexity and to be able to shift your behavior with different cultural environments. And so creativity and cultural competence actually sit on the same set of cognitive skills. That is what intercultural creativity is about. It's if I'm getting people better in this area, they can automatically get better in the other area. And we just strengthen both of those skills together. Wow. I love it. Really inspiring. And it actually ties into a lot of what Toastmasters is about. But before we roll up our sleeves and get into that area, I've got to say something here. You are a professional speaker, as well as the queen of intercultural creativity. I just heard you break down some complex concepts in a way that was extraordinarily clear. I didn't hear a single um or awe or filler word at all. You're better doing a lot better than I am. (laughs) And yet, for some reason, you have been involved in Toastmasters. Janine, huh? There are so many people that have this stereotype, Toastmasters is only for people that can't speak. Now, I know that that's not true. You're living proof, though, of the power of Toastmasters for anyone. Talk to us a little bit about your journey. It has been a journey. It's actually a journey from the speech therapy room. I actually am a stutterer. I still identify as that's one of my identities and I'm a a, a stutterer and I was a serious stutterer in my elementary. Even there's times that I even couldn't even say my own name. And I had a twin sister who won speech debates and, you know, she's brilliant, wonderful woman, but to be a twin and to be the one stuttering. And that had an effect Mm -hmm. on my ideation, my uh, identity to see myself as creative. So there's that connection there. But to go from the speech therapy room to the TEDx stage 
Toastmasters has truly been an integral part of that journey and also helping me see myself and work with my identity and my leadership. And, you know, it's all about mindset and how you see yourself when mm-hmm. you're interacting with other people. And Toastmasters was there since uh, day one. Wow. Let's go back a little bit. When did you realize you were a stutterer? When you realize that people are looking at you odd or making fun of you or have to wait for you and you realize other people aren't speaking the same way. And that usually happens around elementary school. And my mom enrolled me. She fought to enroll me in speech therapy and to walk down that hallway, you know, kind of like mad at um, at God or the universe or just say, like, why was I made like this? Like, why can't I wow. communicate? And, you know, to get your ideas across And my research and my work is about creative thinking And creativity, you know, you can have great ideas in your mind, but if you can't communicate them effectively, it it's it's futile almost. You know, so many people have gone to their grave with their creative ideas still within them. And so Mm. for me to work on my communication, it was paramount. Yeah. What was going to speech therapy like and how old were you when you started that? Third grade. Third grade. Wow. And it it's it was it was difficult because it it was better when you have teachers that that could support you and have that inclusive environment but i remember crying myself to sleep scott uh in the oh. bed even as an adult because there'll be times i remember i was at a university and this uh the president of the college was speaking and i and you know the importance of networking and introducing yeah. yourself to people i said you know what i'm going to go up this is like this, I was in my 30s, so I was a grown wom- a woman, and I went up to her, and I was like, and ah, it, it, everything just got wow. caught. And as a stuttery, we, we call that blocks, and where just, just no air is coming out. And I just remember thinking, oh, she must think I'm an, an idiot. Or, <laughs> you know, I just, you know, you just yeah. start self-bashing. And I finally got it out of, my, 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 my name is Janine. And, you know, and then you just you just see that lost moment go by almost, mm. you know, and, and I had a life of lost moments going by just because I couldn't get out what I needed to say in a fluent, in a fluent way. And it, it hurts because you think you can't contribute and it does a number on your identity as a creative thinker. Wow. Janine, how did you manage to then navigate having stuttering as an issue before you were involved in Toastmasters, what was it like for you day to day? Did you have techniques that you learned in speech therapy or were there other processes that you developed to be able to cope with this or, or was it just you were out there on your own or, or what exactly? I did get tools from speech therapy. So there's a lot of things going on. Even to today, you know, I still utilize them as far as word choice, as far as uh, mm-hmm. breathing, as far as, you know, starting your vowels or, you know, just different things like that are going on concurrently. But there, I, I picked up a book called The Stutter Boy by Eric Gardner um, mm-hmm. in my mid 30s. And I remember reading his story about a young boy with a stuttering problem and then growing up and, you know, even things as simple as picking up the phone and answering or leaving a voicemail where you just get caught. And I read his experience and I just started bawling because you know how mm-hmm. life is when you finally meet someone who's gone oh, through yeah. what you've gone through and they know and you have that tech. In school, we call it a, a text, um, a self to text connection. And it just opened my eyes to say, wow, someone else has gone through this experience mm-hmm. and it's part of who I am. Why, why should I be ashamed of this part? And someone asked me a pivotal question. They said, Janine, if you could you know, have wave a magic wand and start your life over again without your stutter, would you? And of Whoa. course your initial reaction is, yeah, of course. But <laughs> I had to stop and think that struggle of defining who I was with that stutter, it built resilience. It gave me just mm-hmm. skills to be able to read people because I couldn't speak mm-hmm. well. I had to use my other, uh, my other skills to, to try wow. to figure out what was going on and stuff. So my, my empathy was at an all time high. My emotional intelligence was at an all time high because of my, my stutter. And I knew how to navigate certain situations because I didn't have the gift of speaking eloquently like a lot of my, my peers did. But now that I have worked on it, because of Toastmasters lar- largely when I joined in 2015, I now have both of them. And you know, the business world is talking about importance of empathy skills, yeah. importance of sit- situational um, observation and things like that. So I already have these skills in place because 
of that journey. So would I have gotten rid of my stutter? Probably not, because I don't think I would be the woman I am today. It is interesting that you raise that EQ question. One of the things I love about Toastmasters is that many clubs have special guest speakers come in. And there was a special guest speaker at a club that I'm a member of who talked about how to effectively network both within a job and as a business person. And at the end of the day, every single thing that he mentioned as a networking tool was truly about what you're talking about, the EQ applications, not just whether you can speak smoothly or not. He, of course, emphasized the importance of being able to stand up and if you're a business person, give a pitch, or if you are working within an organization to present your ideas. But really, the EQ skills that it sounds like your challenge forced you to develop as a compensatory matter are indeed those that will truly complement the professional development skills that Toastmasters escalates even more. And I love hearing that sort of thing. And, and it, it's critical because a lot of my, all, all of my work is based on brain research. I, I have my degrees in psychology and ed- education and curriculum development, but I say I'm a street neuroscientist because I just, <laughs> I study on, on, under brain, you know, um, brain doctors and I've read all the books, but understanding how the brain works and the brain goes through emotion first. You know, it's very difficult Mm. to learn something if the emotion isn't there. Your Mm. brain retrieves memory more um, if there's emotional um, uh, cues attached to the experience. So emotion is so huge. And the fact that we don't train our K-12 with these skills so they can go into the work workforce, being able to utilize them while they're building whatever they're building, I think is an injustice because people who are high in EQ, they may be, you know, almost satisfactory in other areas, but because they're high in EQ, mm. they're they're able to get into those positions that they want to get in, into. Amazing. Janine, how did Toastmasters end up coming into your life? Or should I ask, how did you end up coming into the life of Toastmasters? Because I knew uh, the minute I met you that whatever impact you had in your Toastmasters group had to have been uh, quite dramatic right from the beginning. Well, I remember it was uh, 2014, right? And I, I am creative. And, and the cool thing about being a teacher in the classroom, I, I'm, I work in the, the corporate world now, but in K-12, you get to be creative in your classroom. And so uh, well, a friend submitted some of my creative lessons to the California State Association for Charter Schools in California, and they selected me for their teacher of the year. And mm. then they reached out and said, we wanted you to, we wanted you to do a keynote. And you're like, Whoa. wait, what? You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me, but, you know, but in front, in front of 20 uh, third graders, you know, I, I'm fine. And, and I do stutter in front of them, but they're, they're, you know, forgiving, you know, they're third yeah. graders and they're more connected to, you know, your, your, just your presentation and just the way you, you deliver the content. But, you know, keynote, I, I've never done that. And so I, a email popped up, said Toastmasters, Toastmasters at lunchtime. And then I just did some more re- research about which one was in my area. And then I remember walking in. It was a, a rented room in a hospital. And there were three old, older Caucasian men there. I was the only one there. Um, and But, you know, the, the, that same club has certainly grown and changed and diversified. And so mm. there's so many, many, many other voices. And it was great to see that. But that particular day... And I was like, I think I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> <Forever>. <laughs> but something told me to stay. And I stayed and there was a man named John Murray there. And his, he, I just looked at him and my heart knew that this was my mentor. Really? Like, you know that feeling where you just know that like, yeah. this person is going to invest in you and get yeah. you where you need to be? And I would not be the speaker. I, I just opened a keynote for a global con- conference uh, this year. And I would not be the speaker I am today without him looking at me and just almost seeing something. You need people in your life who can see what you don't see. John Murray was that for me. And he's still a part of this, the same club. It's the Challengers Club in, uh, in California. And I knew. And he asked me to join. And I joined that day. I normally don't, don't join things the first day that I go. Mm-hmm. I like to check things out or whatever, see yeah. how they run. And I joined that day because... I just knew that that was a place that I needed to be at that time. And he was the man that was going to get me me there. That really touches my heart. 
There are so many people who go through their lives and no one, no one tells them you're that special person. I see something in you. And so, so much talent is lost because that recognition isn't there. One of the things that I have heard consistently about people who have been in Toastmasters, as well as at least one other guest on this podcast, has been that someone in a leadership position in the club that they joined has said exactly what he said to you. And incredible outcomes have occurred. In one case, a guest on this podcast ended up being the president of Toastmasters International itself, all because someone believed in her. So thank you for sharing that. That is something that everyone who is at the start of their career and looking to move forward needs to understand that Toastmasters can give them that sense of mentorship, someone bringing out not just your speaking abilities, but your ability to be a leader. Talk to us a little bit more about your journey, Janine. That sounds amazing, but what a start. Yeah, but before I get back to the journey, I just want to touch this really quick point. Um, I'm big on research and they looked at all the research of leadership. Okay, There's so many mm. different leadership mo models going out there. Which one is the model that is it? And they came that all the research shows that this one model called the Pygmalion model, which is connected to the concept of self-fulfilling Pro uh, prophecy. Yes. And that is, you know, if your leader has a high expectation of you, you're more than likely to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. And if you're under uh, an authoritative position that they think lowly of you or they have low expectation of you, it doesn't even matter if you're a genius, you're more than likely to wow. be um, squashed because the expectation of the leader over you has a huge result and, and um, influence in your ability to be creative, which is my, my work. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. It's actually proof that your mentor or your leader is critical um, in your potential as a speaker, as a creative, as whatever area that you're looking to, to go mm -hmm. into. And I will also add that Toastmasters has embedded in its program model a mentorship system. And many clubs are very, very aggressive about making sure that new members are partnered with a mentor if they want it. So exactly that developmental process can occur. Even if it's just within the confines of that club, the multiplier effect outward can be powerful. So thank you so much for raising that. Yeah, you joined the club. So what happened next, Janine? So I joined and I went and uh, there's a man named an older 86 year old man. He's no, no long, uh, longer here with, uh, mm -hmm. with us, but his name is Gor Gordon and he would just be the person that come in with like quotes that you didn't have to write down. And of course, John Murray and some other people were, were there. But then there's this thing called speech contest that came up. And, you know, I'm just there to, to practice. And, and I practiced <laughs> and I did my, my, my keynote. And everything went well. But I'm still joining because I saw the value in going and the relationship and the culture that that, cult, that, that club had. And then John says, yep, yeah, I think you're going to do this speech contest. And I didn't know what tabletop topics, you know, was before I even joined. And, um, and, and I, I, and he signed me up and first, you know, the levels of the club. So I'm like, okay, well, I do this every meet meeting. Sure. But then I won. And then he levels the area. And you know, with table topics, there's no, like, there's no prep preparation. You just go, right? And so I went and they asked me, you know, living or dead, who would, whose feet would you want to sit at and learn? And mm. I just, it just felt like a force just came through me and I just started speaking and it's, it, wow. and it's online as well. And I spoke about my Angelo, but I didn't speak about like the, the, the person I want to meet is, I just said, when you get, give, when you learn, teach. And then I went in, you know, and then I went into to the talk and John said, I, I felt my Angela was speaking through you <laughs> like it was that powerful. Mm -hmm. And I won. And then I went to the, dis the district and he was right there. And I won district table topics. My first time ever competing Whoa. in everything that wasn't a sport. You know, I I'm a track and field athlete, go Bruins. But my first time ever competing, because don't forget, my twin did debate team stuff. So I saw it, but I never competed in it because mm -hmm. I'm a stutterer. So why would a stutterer be in a speech mm -hmm. contest? Mm -hmm. But John pushed me with compassion and love. And I won all the way to district. And I never forgot that moment mm -hmm. with him there. I don't think anyone will listen who is listening to this will forget that moment. How did it feel? 
to say your name and to share my story, because at the district, you know, she said, what is that mountain that, that you're looking to climb? That was the yeah. prompt. And I, I just laid it out there. And you know that speaker mm-hmm. that speaks very guarded and, you know, like A, yeah. B, and C. And then you know that speaker that speaks from the heart. It's like oh, they just yeah. opened up their soul. Yeah. It was that moment. And then I, 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 I brought in all the information that John taught me, but I painted the hallway that I walked down to go to the speech therapy room. And I said, now with the nonprofit that I started, that hallway is for my students so they can make that journey to know that they can climb that mountain. And because I do creative thinking, I talk about how your subconscious is automatically making connections behind the scenes for, yeah. for you. And, and this is very true during table topics. And I use imagery. So I see pictures as I'm talking after mm. I get the prompt like mm-hmm. 10 seconds before. And my brain automatically puts pictures together. And that helps me do my table topic speech. And that's a creative tool that people could use. So that's what happened there at, at the district contest. And it was amazing to just see the creative tools and the emotional tools and the, my life story tools just integrate to get me the number one spot. When I first joined my Toastmasters group, the initial feedback I got was that I was not connecting to my heart. I was purely speaking from the mind. And once I was able to bridge that gap and become fearless and bring the heart into the speaking, everything changed. Do you think that speech is principally an intellectual exercise or an emotional one? And what would you say to those that are struggling like I was to bring the emotion into it? Well, my work is focused on creativity. And a lot of people think creativity is only artistry, but creativity is so, so much more, right? Um, And I tell people that in order, creativity isn't only artistry, but artistry can help strengthen your ability to think creatively in other fields. Mm -hmm. And I think this is true for this as well. I am a musician by trade. I started in fourth grade trumpet and flute and taught, and then Mm -hmm. I taught 10 years at the elementary age. Uh, Those of you who have a music background, you know hot cross buns, right? Um, Yeah, the hot cross buns Ah. queen, but... It's amazing to see your kids start at hot cross buns in the fourth grade and then see them win jazz festivals when, when they're like Whoa. 17 and 18 years old. That, that is a journey within itself. Wow. But the reason why I'm bringing this up, it's because the arts, music, drama, dance, you know, the arts are another form of communication. Mm-hmm. And so I actually have a Toastmasters article out there when I was put on the cover October 2014. And I talked about how the trumpet was my voice until I was mm-hmm. able to really get mm-hmm. hold of my own speaking mm-hmm. voice. But to learn how to speak through music and, you know, you can hear a, a song without any words and know ex- kind of exactly what the song is trying to, to oh, convey. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, and so I, I tell people, use your artistic experiences to help you learn how to make that connection. Like you can hear the soundtrack to Schindler's List and no words, but you hear the pain through that musical composition. And so I just connected too, because speech is just um, uh, pitches, right? Uh, Silence and sound. Mm -hmm. That's what speech is. And people who have a music background understand um, languages that are pitch languages like Chinese, Japanese, Korean. And, and, And so for people to really get out of their head and get into their heart, I have them communicate through the arts first. And oh. then I have them connect the words to it. Because if you communicate through, um, you know, through movement, through even through poetry, because poetry is words, but the yeah. melodic structure of poetry, you know, yeah, the, the yeah, emotion yeah. behind the work that, um, is there. And then you just do, do it with, with speech and you do it with your pauses, right? You know all about the practice with pauses, with, yeah. with tones, with pitch, with the dynamics, which is another word for volume. All of these things come into play. But people who have a music background have already done it with the instrument. Mm-hmm. Now I need you to do it with the instrument of your voice. Powerful. How then did Toastmasters help you deal with the challenge of stuttering? What exactly changed about your addressing the stuttering as you moved along the Toastmasters educational pathways? You can't get better at something you don't do, number one. <laughs> so you really? Have to look at that. Yes. And it, 
And it also helped me re reframe, which is a, which is a creative gift as well. Be- I still do stutter, but when I share my story, people are more open mm-hmm. because they understand the journey. And public speaking is difficult for anyone, even if you don't yeah. have a stutter. They say it's what the number one fear, like it's even yeah. beats out death, right? Yeah. People would <laughs> rather be in the box than giving the <laughs> eulogy, right? Totally. And, um, <laughs> and, and so, um, so the fact that I'm even on stage and, mm-hmm. and you know the journey says something, but you may not have a stutter. You may have something else that you're struggling mm-hmm. with or you have struggled with. And it just gives you that platform to to release that courage to other people. Courage and fear are both can, can take contagious. You need to be very mindful of who you're around. But you're, if you're around someone who is courageous with that. And so Toastmaster gave me that culture, that network of being mm. around courageous people who are there. And I love the fact, you know, a lot of my work is psychological safety. Psychological mm. safety is directly connected to creative thinking. Mm. Um, because you're more creative if you're in a psychologically safe environment. Absolutely. And Toastmasters is, for sure, my my club, for sure, is a psychologically safe place where Mm -hmm. I can fail. And if you're not willing to fail, you're not going to grow. Because as my coach says, John Murray, you know, growth happens in that in that risk zone, you know, and that's what he taught me when he pushed me through the contest. My first, you know, my first year there, he taught me just go for it. And if you don't win, okay, you tried and you learn and you go back to the drawing board and you do it again next year. You have been in the education and the business fields. And so your perspective on what someone who is leaving the educational system for the first time to enter into the professional world is uniquely able to view the whole process um, from a holistic perspective. I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to how exactly Toastmasters benefits someone who might not necessarily view fear of speech or giving presentations as the most pressing career issue they might have, but they still want to get ahead. Talk to me about any insights you might have on that topic. Well, going back to table topics, um, because I was in the educational world, I was asked to join a board, a very powerful board, and I'll share it. It's a donorshoes.org. And the CEO of LinkedIn was on the board, the senior vice president of Facebook, the number one investor, w- woman investor of the nation, and some other heavy hitters. And then here I am, you know, I'm the kindergarten. Teacher. I was going to say, get yourself some ambition, Janine. <laughs> Meet some higher class people. How come the Queen of England wasn't there, too? <laughs> I know. She probably know, was. But just am- amazing people doing amazing things for education, but they wanted a teacher voice, right? Mm. A perspective on the board. And I didn't even really know what a board was at that time. I was just, mm. a, a, not was just, teachers are very important. And I was an, a, an educator, but that's a whole different world. It's what I'm yeah. trying to say. And so I was asked to join the board. I was very nervous at first, you know, the whole imposter sin syndrome of why am I here? These people are running multi-million dollar companies and I have a, budget of a thousand dollars like you know but i remember i about a year or two in i I had a little bit more comfortable and then i remember before they ended the meeting i said i I have to say some something and i spoke and i just spoke and said a a thank you to them and, and just shared the teacher experience but I remember, like, it was quiet after I was done. I was like, oh. Wow. But I, I, I landed something. And then wow. I went back to my Toastmasters group and I shared that experience. I was like, I had to say something in front of probably 10 of the most, one of the most powerful people in this nation. Yeah. And the table topics training I got in Toastmasters pr- prepared me for that moment. I did not miss that moment. Because of the three years of random table topics, wow. I could speak off the cuff and my brain knew how to connect and I knew how to adjust what I was going to say and I knew how to frame the storyline. It worked at that time and I needed it to work at a time and it was there. So, it is hard to get me in a position where I have nothing to say. You shut me up. Boom. Wow. Tell me the most inspiring Toastmaster story 
you know of, besides your own, because I'm going to be telling your stories, my <laughs> most inspiring Toastmaster story someday. I know. It, it's, it's, as a teacher, I get to meet a lot of young pe people who are going through their own journeys, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful time to be there when you have the aha moment. But as a teacher, you know, they graduate. And luckily for me, I had them from K through five. So I got to be their music te teacher from all, from, for, for those six years. But a lot of teachers, you have them for one year and then they, they, they go on. But I started my nonprofit, so I stayed in contact. And actually, John Murray came to my class to, to do a little table topics with my, my students. But to see people in Toastmasters from where they are, because it's a developmental journey, correct? It you is. just don't show up one day and everything is perfect. Like the <laughs> next, you, you have to work at it. Yeah. And a lot of people are dealing with belief system restructuring as well. So it's not just speaking. It's the belief system. It's the practicing. And then it's the ex execution. And so... To see developmentally where people start and then where they end is pro profound. And I would just say that I've got to um, just connect with people who are giving um, great, great presentations at their work that they weren't yeah. able to do bef bef before. Yeah. Um, it was just it's just amazing to see that kind of like what you said earlier uh, in our pre-show. I just want to be a part of your journey, even even if it's just a little bit. Yeah. And that's what teachers get to feel. That's like, mm. wow, I I invested even just a little bit in mm. in that person. And a part of you is with them. And when you think about legacy, there, there you go. You know, you get to, to leave a little bit of part of your legacy with that person that you took the time. And the thing about Toastmasters is everyone takes the time to invest in you because they give you yeah. feedback, right? Yeah. And they give you encouragement. And if you have a mentor, they give you a lot of feed, feedback and encouragement. And they give you the platform. They give you a platform. And at a time when we need to hear people's voice, people yeah. need a plat platform. Janine, if there is one leader that you could say you admire more than any other and one speaker that you would say you admire more than any other, who would those individuals be? Tell me, I got to know. Well, and if anyone follows me, you may have seen this. And if you've been in my classroom and in my, my space, you will have seen this man. You may have known him. His name is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> you know, living. Yeah, <laughs> some person. <laughs> yes, some random person who just, you know, happened to keep the union together. But here's why I, I have been drawn to him since, since I was in the sixth grade. And I followed him. I've read several books from him. I've been to every site that he's been, his home, his office, his burial site, even Ford Theater where he was um, assassinated. I've been to every place he's, he's been to except uh, Get Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. I haven't been there yet. But the Gettysburg Address, right? The use of the person who spoke before Abraham Lincoln spoke for two hours, two hours. And then Abraham Lincoln goes up, scribbled, scribbled speech um, on a napkin, changed the face of speaking, you know, really yeah. with I don't know how many words, but with a, what 10 sentences. Mm -hmm. Brevity is very hard for folks. Bre brevity mm -hmm. is very hard for me. You know, um, mm -hmm. I believe it was a president. I don't know his name. Um, but he said, you know, if you need me to speak for a day, give me five minutes to prepare. But if you need me to speak for five minutes, I need a whole day to prepare. Mm -hmm. And it's true. So true. But the power of Abraham Lincoln to say what he said in 10 sentences, that is, is the great skill of a great speaker. And the other thing that he did was his team of rivals. Ri rivals. He surrounded himself not with yes men, but he surrounded himself mm. with people who would challenge the status quo yes. and even challenge him and force him to see things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And your great speakers today are able to deliver content from their perspective, but also give you other perspectives. And you want to be under speakers who make you stop and say, hmm, I never thought about it that way. I never saw that before. And Abraham Lincoln did that for the people of his time and for generations to come. So is he your speaker or your leader or both? I think he's both. He's both. Because, you know, even though he wasn't trained, but he's self-taught. Yeah. And what initiative that is. I have to, yes, I, I have to go with Abraham Lincoln for, for both. So I hope that's sufficient. Well, can you imagine if Abraham Lincoln had been in your Toastmasters club? And you were the one who said, oh, I see something special in you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> 
No. And, and lastly, another thing, um, a part of the work that, that I do of my seven gems of intercultural creativity is the adaptability. Abraham Lincoln was very adaptable. Mm. And you've seen, and you, uh, we gained this skill during table topics. You know, I'm a big fan of, tape, of table topics, yeah. as, as, as you've seen. But now in this post-pandemic world, you have to be adaptable and you have to be able to read people and adapt. And one time I was going to give a small speech to another Toastmasters club about tabletop topics because they were going to get in into it. And I realized that they already knew about table topics. They just wanted something else. So I had to quickly change my speech like 10 minutes before it goes on. <laughs> and, and, but good speakers can do that because yeah. they, they know who they're speaking to. Yeah. So Abraham Lincoln was very adaptable as, as well. Love it. Janine, after hearing this, I know people are going to want to find out everything they can about you. Where do they go? Just tell us. Just say. Well, you can find me at the Challengers Toastmasters meeting uh, on Tuesday nights. Boom! <laughs> but on, <laughs> but on, online, I'm on LinkedIn. I love to reach out on link, LinkedIn. My company is called Cafe Strategies, C-A-F-F-E strategies.com. And we combine inclusive DEI work with creative thinking, cognitive strat- strategies for the leaders of today. And so I love to connect. I love to learn. And I love to be creative. Play is fun. Imagination is fun. And you need your imagination to be a great speaker. I'll tell you what else is fun. Talking with Janine Letford on the Transformational Pathways podcast. Janine, it has been great having you on the show today. Thank you for joining us and for sharing your story. For those of you who are listening or watching, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review or a comment. Also, don't forget to follow District 46 on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And if you're new to Toastmasters, check out Toastmasters46.org. That's Toastmasters46.org to learn more about us or visit one of our clubs. Toastmasters is where leaders are made. Thank you so much for joining us on Transformational Pathways. If you enjoyed today's episode or got anything out of it, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're interested in learning more about Toastmasters District 46, check out the link in the show notes below.